Are you stupid? <laughs> so Carson Liddick, did that mess you up now? No, I'm trying to get you in the best light, Bob. I'm going to try real hard. That's, you'll never do that. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so I'm recording Mr. Bob Isler, who is going to tell us about logging in the Okefenokee Swamp, historical logging, and he's been doing this for a number of years, and he's just a wonderful fellow, and a <laughs> Hall of Fame forester, director of the Center for Forest Business, if you remembered. Yeah. Take it away. All right, well, first of all, let's <laughs> give a, a round of applause to the newest fellow in the state of Georgia, Dick Reimeyer. Officially inaugurated at the Fellows Breakfast at the SAF meeting in Charleston, and we're, we're mighty proud Dick, of the honor that you have achieved. Uh, what I'm going to talk to you about tonight is uh, rail logging in the Okefenokee Swamp, and you can see the date. So, this is going to be ancient history, even for me, it's ancient history. Uh, and we'll show some movies tonight. But remember, guys, y'all don't know this, but there were no sound movies before 19. 30. What is that date there? 27. This is no sound. You got to listen closely to me. <laughs> so, um, the. Uh, All right, this is the Okefenokee Swamp area uh, in South Georgia. This is way across Georgia right here. Fargo's over here, folks, and somewhere <laughs> over here. Um, and this is a map that just shows the, uh, the fire history of, of the area. The Okefenokee National Wildlife Refuge, as it exists today, is about 425,000 acres. Swaps between two states. The Georgia-Florida line is right here. The uh, St. Mary's River, which you'll see in the film, comes this way. This one, it goes that way. Uh, both head, or, if they're headwaters in the... In the uh, Okay. St. Mary's, of course, drains to the Atlantic Ocean, and the Swanee drains to the uh, Gulf of Mexico. So that's the area we're going to be talking about. Not all of it is owned by the Fed. There's still a good bit of land in the Okefenokee Swamp itself that's still privately held. Um, although the Feds do have the majority of it, we'll talk a little bit about how they got it, because the company that I'm going to talk about tonight is actually the one that uh, sold it to the uh, Fed at a much, much discounted uh, rate. So uh, I was interested uh, in the Okefenokee. I uh, have been fishing and exploring and camping in it since I can remember. I grew up in Waver also, so it's real close uh, to get there. Uh, my uh, grandfather was a physician and uh, he treated a lot of uh, families who lived in the Okefenokee. Uh, and people lived on the islands uh, in the Okefenokee up until 1936. So he would go down uh, into the swamp and on an occasional basis and, and uh, deliver babies or uh, treat folks uh, for whatever maladies they had. So he got to be well known. I have an unusual name, as you well know. So it was pretty easy for me to talk to these people who are pretty clannish. Uh, a lot of people um, liken them to the uh, uh, folks that live in uh, remote areas in Appalachia. They actually speak their own form of English. And if you're not one of them, it, it's pretty apparent. So the... Uh, the families in the uh, in the swamp, the Lees and the Dixons and the Stricklands and a whole bunch of other different types um, of, uh, of families that live down there in, in the Thrifts and the Tatums, uh, all of them um, were uh, very, very good friends with my grandfather, so I have an entree with them that most other people would not have. So when I started doing my work on the Okefenokee, um, I ran across uh, one person who had a, uh, an academic connection.
connection to the Okefenokee. Now everybody remembers, or should remember, a consulate you won't. But everybody else should know who Joel Chandler Harris is. I do. Yeah. And what did he write? <laughs> what did he write? Brown Rabbit. Brown Rabbit, that's right. Well, it's... Uh, some connection to Eden to Jordan. Yeah, some connection to Eden to Jordan, that's right. So, um, his son, Lucian, wrote a book called The Butterflies of Georgia. I have that book, and I was looking at it one time, and it was, and Lucian was talking in there about um, the uh, Okefenokee and the Okefenokee uh, and its impact on the Georgia Society of Naturalists and uh, how much work that they had done in the swamp and the fact that the Hembert Lumber Company, who we'll talk about in a few minutes, uh, was instrumental in encouraging that scientific work. So I said, gee, you know, that's interesting. And about six months later, I read in the Atlanta papers that Lucian Harris was still alive. So I called him, and I told him who I was and what I was interested in. And he said, well, have you talked to Julia Hebert? And I said, no, who's she? And he said, well, she's the last remaining heir of the Hebert Lumber Company. That's Julia. <clears throat> and she lives in uh, Naples, Florida. So I called her and I told her who I was and um, Lucia had written a letter of introduction for me also and she said, well, come on down, I've got some stuff that I'd like to show you. So drove to Naples, Florida, uh, from Wake Ross and uh, she had a whole stack of cans of 16 millimeter film that her family had had produced by a Hollywood photographer. Again, photography, film photography at that time was um, not as prevalent as it currently is today. And so only a very few specialists in the country could, could produce uh, good quality footage. Um, so she gave it to me. And uh, she was in her mid-80s at the time. This was 1976. Um, and then she said, well, you know, you probably ought to meet my son. He lives up in Maine. So uh, I did. His name is Charlie Bassett. And you'll see Charlie's name on, on the film here. And Charlie had worked for uh, Burlington Corporation, which is a big textile company in New York, made a fortune there, and retired to a tree farm in Maine. And uh, so um, based on his mother's introduction, I went up to Maine and met with Charlie. I met with his wife. They live in Arundel, Maine, which is near Kenny Buckport, where President Bush has his uh, summer house, uh, right on the coast. And they've got a tree farm uh, there, a couple hundred acres, and he was interested in having me look at that, so I was glad to tell him what I thought of it. It was a really, really nice place. And, uh, and he showed me a couple of books that uh, the family had about hunting logs and the things that they had shot in the swamp and so forth. You'll see part of that in these films. And um, he said, um, we know um, that somewhere in here there are some canisters of film that were all of, of pictures that were rolls of film that were taken. Um, but we can't find them. And so um, over the years I've run into Charlie at Tree Farm. Uh, conventions, as far as landowner conventions and so forth and so on. Got to know his, his wife, Peggy, who's um, still alive. Charlie died several years ago. Uh, and she said, called one time, and she said, Bob, we found the film. And it was in a highball uh, that was made in the early 1700s. And, and literally, there was a secret drawer in it that they didn't find until they moved it one day. When they moved it, they found about ten of these. <coughs> and so what you're seeing today is what was in here. So from 1942 when those uh, pictures were taken until about three years ago, nobody ever saw them. And they were never developed. I don't spend the money to have them developed. So that's what you're going to see tonight. Uh, so, this is Julia um, coming into Floyd's Island where they had a, uh, a camp. The cabin's still there, now it's owned by the feds. Um,
This is called Rain, which is their home that they had built out of hard cypress that was harvested in the Okie Fanoki um, from the years that I mentioned. So they bought the swamp in 1900, they started logging in 1909, they ran out of the economic timber in 2000, excuse me, in 1927. That doesn't mean that they cut all of it, but economically they got all that they could at the time with the technology they were using, which you'll see in a minute. Uh, that's still there. Uh, it's on the banks of the St. Mary's River, and, and there's a marker out in front of it where the, uh, the treaty that Bartow signed with the Creeks, ceding all of that portion of Georgia to the United States, was signed. Uh, so it's doubly historic. Uh, it's on, on the St. Mary's River. Uh, which is what you see. Okay, so this is the way it looked in 1942. Uh, and this is the boat canal going into Floyd's Island in 1942. I went in that same canal uh, in 1996, and we had to drag the boat in there. <coughs> Fires exploded. Everything has, has grown in. Uh, so it's very difficult to get to Floyd's Island today, although you can certainly still do that. Uh, this is the boardwalk that they had built uh, from the island down to where the uh, boat canal came in. Uh, and you'll see some of that stuff in the film. Uh, this is the, uh, the cabin on Floyd's Island that they built, again, out of hard cypress. So it's not going anywhere <laughs> unless it catches on fire. Um, if you were there today, all the, the, the uh, national, uh, the Fish and Wildlife Service has cleared all of this kind of stuff away. So you've got a nice big uh, yard all around it, which actually is pretty good for fire protection because, like that, if you ever had a, a spark and all the stuff that you see laying on the roof there, it would have been gone pretty quick. They entertain all kinds of folks down here. Harris with the Georgia Society of Naturalists, uh, Herbert Stoddard, who was he? Okay. Okay. The quail guy, right? <clears throat> prescribed burn guru. The first prescribed burning was ever done, Stoddard did on Peverd Land in the Okefenokee. He was a frequent visitor here. Uh, so uh, the Hebrews encouraged uh, people to come down, uh, all kinds of folks, senators as well as scientists, uh, to come uh, look. Uh, again, another shot of the boardwalk, and just you know, look at the swamp conditions there and think in your mind, if I wanted to log it, how would I do it? This is way before the advent of swamp people. <laughs> 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 the other way of getting to the island at that time was by railroad, which ran from Hebertville, which still exists. It's a suburb of White Cross now. Uh, but there was a, uh, a narrow gauge railroad, the White Cross and Southern, which ran from Hebertville down into the Okefenokee Swamp. Uh, and this is the old rail line, the tram bed, that came up on the Floyd's Island. Also went to Billy's Island, where about 2,000 people lived at one time. This is everywhere they went. And you can uh, see these are maps of the, uh, these are the main lines, and then these are the spur lines that came out. So how they did this... So they hired a guy by the name of John Hopkins in 1900 when they bought the swamp. John was a surveyor um, from Crescent, Georgia, which is near Darien. And he came in and did the first cruise. And so after he got through cruising the swamp, he knew where the timber was and he knew where it wasn't. And then he devised a method of logging it, and that was to build a railroad line into the swamp, cut your trees down, skid them up onto the rail car, and haul them away to the sawmill in Hebrew 
sawmill. The sawmill still exists because it's made out of concrete. And again, it ain't going anywhere. Uh, so you can still see that. But this is a very, very accurate map that they did of all their logging railroads, the main lines, and then all the little branch lines. The main lines were built just like you build a railroad today, with cross ties and piling. Uh, John's account, uh, which was published by the Georgia uh, Society of Naturalists Bulletin Number no. 4, said that in some places they had to drive piling 90 feet deep before they hit the bottom. Uh, and then they would put the, uh, lay the tracks, put the cross ties down, lay the tracks on top of that. And you can actually go pretty fast as you'll, you'll see some of this. Now, all this little dendritic pattern here, forestry students don't know what that word means, right? Okay, those are all the spur lines. And those were made by getting a whole bunch of worthless hardwood, black gum, uh, <coughs> stuff like that, bundling it up and throwing it down in the water or on top of the peat. Then you would lay your rails on top of that and drive your train very slowly. And when you got through harvesting, and well, I'll explain to you how they did that, then you just picked up the rail and took it with you. If you know what you're looking for today, you can still see the main lines uh, or the, the, the remnants of the main lines. <coughs> Before the Hebrews got it, Jackson, a fellow named Jackson, was a lawyer from Atlanta, bought the swamp from the state for 32 cents an acre in the uh, late 1800s, uh, all of it. And his idea was that he was going to drain the swamp into the uh, swamp, uh, St. Mary's River, sorry. And then he felt that that land that had been swamped was going to be as fertile as the Nile River Valley. And he was going to make an absolute killing. So uh, he ran into a little problem called Trail Ridge, which is an interesting geologic feature that runs from north of Waycross way the heck down into Florida. And at some points, it's about 200 feet above the surrounding land. It's an ancient sandbar. That's why the Okefenokee's there, because when the seawater receded, the sandbar was there and kept that water in there. So Trail Ridge still exists today. US-1 runs down part of it in uh, Ware County. And uh, when he got to Trail Ridge, uh, he had a bunch of Georgia Tech engineers working with him, apparently, because <laughs> instead, of, instead of cutting uh, a square, kind of a box down into the sand, they cut a V. Well, when they cut the V, the sand just kept falling back in. So they went broke. And uh, they tried to do this at a place called uh, Camp Cornelia or, or the uh, uh, Swanee Canal, which is in the south of Folkestone, which is where the National Wildlife Refuge headquarters is today. Uh, so they went broke. The Hebrides came in. They bought it. They surveyed the place. They knew they weren't going to drain it. They were after one thing, and that was salt timber. Cypress salt timber. They didn't give a flip about the hardwood. They could care less about the pine. All they wanted was heart cypress. That's what they went after. They got it. They cut a lot of hardwood, which other companies, they subcontracted out to other companies. All the pine was subcontracted out. Uh, and so they made a lot of money off of it, but they didn't deal with it. They were only in, uh, interested in the uh, heart cypress. This is uh, one of the engines uh, that they took down into the swamp. Uh, on the mill yard in Pepperville at about 1912. All right, look closely. Um, you see underneath the, uh, the tram water. Now that's the permanent main line, and that's what it looked like. Very well engineered, very well built. So it could take a train as big and as heavy as that thing right there, because it's the all cast iron, remember? And then you can see the logs um, behind. Now, Mr. Barry, 
Can you see these two rails here? <clears throat> Bill, <clears throat> are they straight or are they something else? <clears throat> They're not straight. They're crooked. <laughs> you get your eyes fixed. <laughs> This is one of the spur lines. That's why I say you had to drive your train really carefully. Look how crooked that is. This is an uh, American overhead steam skitter. Uh, and what they would do is they would go in and set up a spar tree, which is this thing right here. You can see the guide line coming out with a block and tackle with Christie carriage right here attached to a log. So they copied just exactly what they were doing on the West Coast. And they put, applied it to the South. Now, John Hopkins thought a lot about how he was going to do this. They bought the swamp in 1900. They didn't log, start logging it until 1909 because they were planning. They were cruising. They were planning. They were building the main lines. They were figuring out the technology. And so um, each one of, of, where, of, of the things that you see where you've got a spar tree is what they call a skitter set. And so they would go out 600 feet. That was the length of it. But that's how far they could stretch the, the cable all around that spar tree. And they'd cut everything they could with a gator tail or a cross-cut saw, as some people call it. Before they did that, they'd send the crew out a year ahead of time, and they'd girdle the tree to kill it, so that when they cut it and it fell in the water, it didn't sink, because it had a year to die and a year to dry out. So uh, they would go out, then they'd cut that stuff up again by hand, <laughs> cross-cut saws in whatever length they wanted, and then they would put tongs on the end of it, it's like a pair of ice tongs. They grab that thing and start that steam engine and lift it up into the air, carefully over to the uh, rail car, lay it down, they're ready to go. When they exhausted that 600 feet foot set, they'd cut the spar tree down, they'd move on to the next one. Just like that, on and on and on and on. Constantly taking up this stuff and just rolling it forward. So quite an engineering feat, and again, remember, this is early 1900 technology. <clears throat> a much better picture. This is uh, apparently a main line here because the, 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 uh, uh, you can see the really good uh, cross ties in good shape. The rails are straight. You see your spar tree, uh, and you can see how they actually use the tongs here to pick it up. And they'll swing it over, lay it on the rail car, take it up to Heaverville, which was about 17 miles away. <clears throat> that's my grandfather, excuse me, no, that's my dad, uh, standing in front of a uh, log at the Heaverville, uh, the Heaverville sawmill. Uh, some of the butts of these logs were so big they had to dynamite them to blow them apart because they were too big to get in the door to get sawed. So, uh, lots of stuff going on. You can see how they're trying to, you can see the wedges that they're trying to drive in here to split that log and, and get it open so that they can at least uh, get it to the, uh, to the saw. If you look really closely, there's a man's head at the end of that log, which means that he's standing up and the log is here. So if you get real close, you can see that. That's the size of timber that they could, could be dealing with. All right, any questions so far? So from 1909, in 1927, they did this. They logged all over the Okefenokee, and you saw where they did. Is there virgin cypress still in the Okefenokee? Yes, there is, around Turkey Lake, Monkey Lake. Could they have gotten it? Sure. But to them, it wasn't. You get it out, process it, sell it, they would have done it at a loss because of the 
distance but had to travel to get it. So they slept. Any so, idea on how many board feet they took out in the course of 1909 to 27? Uh, yes, 2.2 billion board feet of cypress. 800,000 cross ties. Hmm. And an untold amount of pine and salt timber. Because they didn't care, they didn't count it. Bob, what was their, their main product out of the cypress? Molding for the European market. Molding? Molding for the European market. Wow. Yeah. Your export. Oh, yeah, yeah. Italy was a huge customer um, for them. Um, so, they do this until 1927, and they, uh, they shut down the logging operations. The sawmill with the inventory operates another year before they finally run out of the inventory on the mill yard. And then they shut that down. So that's 1928. And uh, the Hebbards themselves really, really liked there. They were from Philadelphia. Um, and they um, fell in love with the Okie Finoki and saying they built Cold Wayne and it became their home. And so when they got through um, with all the logging, um, then they um, just retired to Cold Rain and, and they had all these people that would come in like uh, uh, Herbert Stoddard um, and um, a lot of people from the uh, Field Museum in Chicago, um, uh, a lot of people from the Cornell Bird Lab in uh, New York because there were ivory bill woodpeckers in the Okefenokee sighted there as late as about 1919. Um, so they encouraged a lot of scientific study, a lot of scientific interest, and you would be amazed if you go to the University of Georgia Library to see how many different diverse subjects were studied uh, in the swamp at that time, sponsored by the Hebrides. So um, in uh, about 32 or so, there was another one of these hair-brained ideas to drain, uh, to, well, not to drain the swamp, but they were going to build a barge canal from Saint Mar the St. Mary's River to where? Gulf of Mexico. They were going to go through the Okefenokee Swamp. <laughs> and they actually uh, had a, a party of uh, surveyors from the Interstate Commerce Commission that came down and, and surveyed the route. Um, and they could have done it. And as late as my high school years, uh, in the late 60s, because the only channel that we could get was Channel 4 out of Jacksonville, so you had to listen to Gator television <laughs> all the time. Uh, there was talk, even into the 1970s, about the Cross Florida Barge Canal. Where they're going to go from Jacksonville down, or excuse me, yeah, down the St. John's River, and then dig over to the Gulf of Mexico. So you didn't have to go down to Miami and all that kind of stuff. GP, well, GP had some timber on that. Yeah, so anyway, uh, that, that idea died anyway. So the Hebrides didn't want that to happen. Uh, now, had they allowed this to happen, they could have made a pile of money selling right away or leasing the road and then charging a royalty for every ton that got towed in through there. But they didn't want to do that. So um, um, the, some of the scientists that they had encouraged were pretty good friends with Roosevelt. And so um, they struck a deal um, to sell the, all the Okefenokee to uh, the feds, or the Okefenokee that they owned, uh, to the feds for $1.25 an acre in 1936. So the feds took over January 1st, 1937 was the uh, first wildlife refuge was created by executive order. Not created by Congress, but by executive order. Um, so, the feds said, all right, we own it, everybody has to get out. So all the families that were living there had to go. And the town that was in, built, on, built on Billy's Island to support the logging operations uh, was uh, disassembled, put on rail cars, and hauled out. And every house in the swamp was hauled out, and all people were made to leave. 
And as they came out, as the last train came out, they took the permanent lines with them. Uh, except in just a few places where the, the piling are still there, and you can see it. And if you know where to look, you can still see concrete mile marker posts from Hebertville going in to the Okie Dokie. Most people, I mean, if, if they find them, they, next time you see it, it's in their front yard. Uh, but there's still a few out there if you know where to look. Uh, so since that time, the Okie Fanoki has been in federal hands. Wouldn't have been had the Hebbers not had a conservation mindset rather than a profiteering kind of a mindset, because they certainly could have kept it. Uh, but uh, but they, uh, they sold it to the feds uh, for a pretty paltry sum at that time. So, uh, the, Bob, yes. I know the Chester family. Chester's Island was there, so all the Chester's had to leave Chester Island in 1937. Yes, they did. Oh. Glenn's still not happy about it. I bet. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, the only thing that was allowed to stay of a human cultural nature is the Lee Family Cemetery on Billy's Island. It's still there. And the Lee family can go there at any time to visit. So, another question back here. Yes, um, Morgan. How many acres was the uh, size of the property that they owned? About uh, 460,000 acres. How much did they harvest? I don't know, I never counted it, but you can do a preliminary of it if you want. <laughs> About 70% though is my rough calculation. And again, remember, at that time, as you'll see in the film, a lot of this is open water. So it's not just swamp like you saw where you you're parting the green briars and the uh, red maples and slogging through the peat muck and all that kind of stuff. And then you come to what they call a prairie, which may go three or four miles before you pick up trees again. That was also part of the engineering challenge that they had. Is they, you know, when you came to a prairie, you had to cross it. And so you, you built all this main line over three or four miles of water. Um, and you didn't get to have anything to show for it other than the timber that was on the other side of it. That's why when they got to some of the more remote areas, they just said, no, nah, uh, it's, it's not going to be worth our effort um, at that time to get it. So, um, the Okie uh means land of the trembling earth. So if you go down there and you get off the hill, which is dry land, and anything that's out of the water is the hill, and you, and you actually get out there, you can actually walk on the swamp in the water and you can bounce on it uh, without falling through. And so that's the trembling earth part of it. But just as soon as you're walking along, you're going to go from trembling earth to water. <laughs> and untold numbers of gators and snakes and all that kind of stuff, so if you scare them, you don't want to go there. Um, any other questions before I switch over to the film? There a book, Trembling Earth? Yeah, it's marginal. <laughs> <laughs> Bob, before you put the film on, uh, yeah, really. putting the putting the Swanee Canal through the Trail Ridge. I mean, these were engineers. Yeah. And um, you know, I haven't done any kind of in-depth research, but if you went to the southwest and the southwest side of the swamp, couldn't have been more of a job, a good job done draining it towards the Gulf. Well, all you would have had to have done was kind of channelize the uh, Swanee River. Swanee River. That would have been the smart -er thing to go to do, but it was a long way. Oh. Here you had to go four miles, and bingo, you're in the, the St. Mary's River. Okay. Just four miles, and we got Georgia Tech folks digging this for us. Why can't we get there? <laughs> Good question. <laughs> Yes, it is. Yeah, we. Uh, uh, they've done a lot of peak cores, and they've documented major fires going into the Okefenokee as far back uh, as 1740. And they come on a uh, about a 35 to 40 year cycle. Um, so yeah, the Okefenokee has to have fire if it's going to stay the way it is. The uh, 07 fire and the 11 fire did real good job of putting it back the way it was uh, because it, it actually had gotten, it was, it was going to another
secessional state, so it was, it was going out of swamp into forest. All right, let me see if I can make this uh, work here. As far as I know, these are the only films ever taken that early. Uh, a lot of photographs were taken. Now, this is Julia here, who helped me out a lot. That's her sister over there. Uh, they're on Floyd's Island. A couple of turtles. Again, this is Chase Prairie with a gator that they've uh, caught. You can see that uh, he's, uh, they caught him on a, uh, hooked him on some sort of a uh, float there. It looks harmless. That <laughs> is a big gator. 
you'll see in a minute, he ain't happy. <laughs> so how would you like to be cruising and run into one now? <laughs> to hear all kinds of bear stories up here, but you don't hear a bunch of gator stories. You get hit by that tail, you can break your leg easily. He is definitely mad. <laughs> and that's a hunting party. Um, not like we would normally go hunting in South Georgia. Um, this is cold rain. They got some goats. And also, they're, uh, they're not hunting birds with goats. But, uh, <laughs> but you'll see here that they've got a string tied to the dog. Um, so, yeah, they don't want to lose it. Okay, so that's the way Cole Rain looked back in the, uh, uh, the 1920s. Again, that gives you an idea of um, you were going to log what you had to get through to get to the good timber. 
and this is coming out onto uh, Chase Prairie. So the, the thing that I told you, you're not going to see. And to this day, I don't understand it. They brought this guy from Hollywood who shot all this film. A lot of operations were going on at the time, and there is not one inch of film about the logging operations. <laughs> Unless there's another secret drawer somewhere. Yeah. But I asked Julie about it, and she said she never recalled, and she said this is all the film that there is, and uh, she didn't recall them ever shooting any of the, uh, the logging operations. All this stuff is in the archives at the University of Georgia. Anybody at any time can go look at any of it. Uh, this particular one has captions on it that I have put on there, the others don't. And that's a duck that they shot. Fork stick. Yep. Decoys. Mr. Hepburn, Dan Hepburn, the guy who actually owned everything. And he died at Coal Rain in uh, 1948. And that's uh, their ice box. Was, was good water a problem? No, good water is never a problem in the Okefenokee. Never. It's always flowing. The Okefenokee Swamp, technically, is not a swamp. Has free flowing water all the time. When they used to fight fire in the Okefenokee, they would take a pump just like this, with them over their shoulder, <laughs> they jam it down the ground and start pumping. The water comes out. There's their ice that no doubt they brought in for white cross on a daily basis. Yeah, it's gonna black, kill. It's gonna kill whatever is in it. It's black, black looking. Yeah, it looks like a uh, really, really strong tea. Yeah. They have any turpentine camps on that island? Uh, they did turpentine on Billy's Island, but no camps. Hmm. There were camps all around Cold Range. There weren't any on Cold Range. And this guy is very, very famous. His name is Uncle Billy. And he did not live uh, in a house. He lived in a tent his entire life uh, on, the, on the St. Mary's River. That's typical Swampers outfit, white shirt, overalls. And that's some, um, uh, I never have been able to figure out exactly what they're doing with those shingles there. I guess bringing them in or uh, trying to store them or something. But again, you can see the rail that comes up onto the uh, Swamp, and then there's the part of the main line that's coming up. So that stuff is pretty well built. But you can see what happens to you if you get off of it. And the rail cars themselves are pretty simple. Not a whole lot to them. And you didn't want a whole lot of weight, especially if you were uh, on one of the spur lines. So Bob, they didn't scare any of those logs with oxen? No, sir. Why? Why? No, it's, yeah, nowhere to skip. It's, you, nothing, nothing to hold it up. And the oxen would have bogged down and the gators would have got them. Yeah, right. <laughs> yep. Alright, now watch how they turn this car around.
these, these are some of the workers' quarters behind. They still are there if people actually still live. Now, one of the things I tell my students in the, my policy class when we talk about swamps so forth and so on is you could, until 1936, you could get away with murder. I can take my Yankee friend, Consolated here, mm -hmm. into the swamp. No, I wouldn't leave him. <laughs> and I'd take two or three with you. With and I'd put a pistol to his head and I'd pull the trigger and I'd kill him and I'd let him drop dead right there. <laughs> now, I know why. And what would happen to me? Nothing, because they couldn't determine what jurisdiction. They could not determine where the county lines were, so they never knew where to take the case to which grand jury. So I'm never going to the swamp with you. Well, you can't <laughs> pass all the line of heads. Oh. <laughs> So again, uh, to give you an idea of how open it was, and it's starting to get back that way again, but it takes massive fires to keep it this way. And you said it's for 37 is the fence on 37, January the 1st. So the swamp was a pretty lawless place, and lots of folks were murdered down there, and nobody had to answer for it. <laughs> now this is in Swain Canal, and you can see even today folks fishing all up and down that because uh, it's, it's uh, still pretty good fishing. And the Swanee Canal was the, the, the canal that was dug to try to drain the swamp. So it was dug into the, from the swamp outward. And when they hit trail ridge, that was the end of it. And this is actually where it ended, right here. And that's, that's what's called Camp Cornelia now, which is the National Wildlife Refuge headquarters. And again, back on uh, Floyd's Island. And this is the actual survey crew that came through for the Interstate Commerce Commission. Uh, well, they were looking to uh, put their uh, canal all the way through the swamp. One of those guys is uh, United States Senator Walter F. George, but I'm, I'm not sure which, uh, from Georgia, I'm not sure which one he is. Not that one. That was the sheriff. I was going to say, that was our G man. That, that was the sheriff. Uh, one of the folks who folks in that I, when I showed this, this about 20 years ago, oh, gee, that, I know who that was. I, that was our sheriff. So, uh, anyway, there they are going out to see where they're going to put this uh, million dollar making canal. Okay, this is, uh, they also have a place up in uh, uh, Huron Mountain, Michigan. Where they have a honey camp up there. Uh, and again, another shot of cold rain from the St. Mary's River uh, is still there today, and the barn family owns it. That's, that's the back, backyard looking out towards the river. Did you say the barn family? Yes. Like Will Barn? Like Will Barn, right, his cousins. Will doesn't own it, but his family does. Pretty majestic place. Uh, that's the historical marker I was talking to you about that marks where the treaty was signed. As far as I know, everybody that you've seen is dead. <laughs> Folks, and going out to Camp 
Cornelia. Uh, if you look closely and you're from the area, you can see several, but most of those buildings still are in Folkestone.